so now we're going to learn some uh, more obscure parts of uh, C++. First thing we're going to talk about is the virtual inheritance, uh, which is involving multiple inheritance. So we haven't, we haven't really talked about this yet in our, in our discussions of inheritance. So let's say we have a struct called uh, um, walk, and it's got you know, how many legs you have, and it's maybe got like a walk function or something like that on it. And then we can have a struct called fly walker fly. I don't know. And the fly struct will give you wings like Red Bull. And it's got like some sort of fly function that might fly you around the map or something like that. I don't know. It's all very abstract right now. Uh, let me just make it do nothing. Yep. And then if we wanted to implement a bat class, the bat class could inherit both from walk because they can walk poorly, but they could. Uh, they could slowly walk. Uh, so the bat class could inherit from walk and it could inherit from fly. Look at that. We're inheriting from two things. Huh. How cool. And the bat constructor could, for example, set our number of legs equal to two, because we only have two legs instead of four. And this is a little dangerous because we have a lowercase walk. It looks like a constructor, but it's not because capitalization matters. Uh, I'm a little dubious on this, but eh, whatever. Okay, so uh, da, 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 da. yeah, maybe we'll just have the function saying um, uh, walk around the map. So this will this will be replaced later on with code that'll pathfind around and stuff like that. And we can do the same thing here. We'll fly around the map. Okay. So we can make a variable called Batman. No, 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 no. Okay. And Batman can walk, man.walk. And man.fly. And both of these things work just fine. Walk around the map, fly around the map. You guys see that? So when you do multiple inheritance, and you might notice, oh, wait. Where where is the public? Like, isn't it supposed to say public there? Uh, there's a reason why you structs structs uh, do public inheritance by default. Classes do private inheritance that nobody uses by default. And so with classes, you always have to do public colon public something. Structs you just use colon. It's less typing. I like structs. So we can and in, like we can inherit from two different things. And so when we do this, it copy pastes all this into here, and it copy pastes all this into here. And there we go. And so some people actually will do their class design this way, where they have basically different components they sort of inherit off of. Um, I don't like this coding style. Uh, you end up having um, a class hierarchy that looks like a conspiracy theory board. Uh, if you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, Like, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, where you just have the lines going, you're trying to sketch out, you know, you're trying to sketch out all the different, <laughs> that's funny. You're trying to sketch out all the different connections between all your different classes and, and things like that. You know, it's just, it, it gets, it gets too hard to wrap your brain around. Uh, so I tend not to write code this way, but some people do. Uh, my professor, like when I took uh, the equivalent of CSI 40 and 41 at UC San Diego, uh, my professor, loved inheritance, he loved classes, he loved all this kind of stuff. He was a math guy and there's a certain amount of mathematical purity to inheritance and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't write code this way because I don't know, either I'm too smooth brained to handle a hundred different classes and all their different relations to each other or maybe I'm more intelligent. It's, it's kind of hard to tell, I don't know. <laughs> So, do you, guys, do you guys get this though? Um, uh, what if um, what if I made Batman const? What is is this gonna work? What do you guys think, Olson? Is it gonna work if I make Batman const? Brandis should be fun. Not change anything, right? Not change anything. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Wrong. Because, because, you guys want to see the error message for this? Because, 
We are discarding qualifiers. We're discarding qualifiers. What the hell is a qualifier? There are two things that count as qualifiers in C++. They're called CV qualifiers. One of them is const. The other one is called volatile. And volatile, uh, you're not going to need to know probably ever. Uh, but I will mention it here for correctness because today we're doing like trivia, like C++, like more C++ keywords, you know, like the rest of the story. I don't know. So volatile means um, you can't uh, you can't assume the variable will have the same value later. Maybe that's maybe that's one way of putting it. And so this one also uh, maybe we're getting yeah we're discarding qualifiers. Yeah. So what the what the hell does that mean? Well, let's say we have a volatile uh, int x equals ten, and then you set uh, x equal to twenty, and then you see out the value of x. What is, what is the value of X? What is, what is going to be printed out here? It's not a trick question. You guys, you guys probably know the answer to this. If you paid any attention in week one of CSI 40, you should be able to get the answer to this. 20 is correct. Okay. Can the optimizer figure that out? Can the optimizer prove, let's, let's get rid of the volatile keyword for a second. Uh, can the optimizer prove, like mathematically, look at the code and prove this is always going to be 20? What do you guys think? Can it, it's like, it can't ever not be 20, right? Yeah. It, it, the, the, no, the optimizer can. The optimizer can look at this and just replace X and just put in 20 there. And in fact, it could even delete that equals 10, right? Because that 10 is never going to come up ever. Like it's not nowhere in here. Is the value of 10 ever going to be used? So why set it? Why put the value of, of, of 10 there ever in the code? It's non-functional. So with volatile, you cannot make those assumptions. Okay. So if I make this a volatile int x, um, maybe we'll go on to Godbolt. Godbolt. Um, uh, x86, let's do arm32, really, arm, uh, sure, okay, uh, and, um, and, uh, foo and x, return x plus 10, return foo, uh, Twenty. Return to X. Okay. So we've got the optimizer on. You guys remember the optimizer dash O three. Even with dash O one, it should be able to prove that. Good. So even at, even at the lowest optimization setting, do you, do you guys understand what I mean by it can prove that what what the answer is going to be? Like X will always be twenty when we call foo. Foo always adds ten to the number passed in. Therefore, the number here. Is going to be 30 always so sort of really do you understand what i mean by like it can prove this and so you notice here in the assembly this is the assembly this is like csi 45 stuff it never actually calls foo there's no call to foo anywhere in here uh, because it, it knows what the value is always going to be right if, if we do something clever like maybe like set this to like a random number or something like that If we if we do something where like maybe we can't we can't prove the um, we can't prove that the number is constant then we'll have to call it. So start early, you understand? Like what I mean by it can prove it. Like this this number r zero is the return value of a function in arm arm thirty two, and so this this function here is main. This function is always going to return thirty always. It can predict it. It's not just prediction. It can prove it. It can prove that at compile time. The 
this program will always return 30. And this is on the lowest optimization setting. There's far more difficult, uh, far more complex optimizations than this. However, if a variable is volatile, you can't make a lot of those assumptions. So for example, um, you can't guarantee that um, you can't guarantee that the value of X uh, isn't going to be used. Okay, so here you can see it's actually with the optimizer on, it is still storing the value of 10 right here. It's still storing the value of 10 into memory. It then puts 20 into the variable and it stores 20 into memory. Um, and then it, you know, uh, it's, it's inlining the function out. Uh, so it is going to just add 10 to the value and then it's going to um, return that. So, because we never set X, right? So we, if we say X is equal to foo X like that, then you'll see it generate like another store right here. And so it adds 10 to it and then stores it again. So it keeps storing the value over and over again. And the reason for that, the reason why volatile exists is because, does volatile just trump the next end call? Mm, the reason why volatile exists is, and I think the only time I've ever used it like in my professional career is when I was writing a device director. And so we had a we had a we had a bit of hardware. Uh, we we were making uh, arcade games. In arcade games, um, got I've got some joysticks around here somewhere, but um, I guess an Xbox controller would work or something like that. Um, but like we we you know like you guys have all seen like these things, right? These little these little things. Uh, when we were doing it, like we had like the big industrial sized like. Like they're meaty and they have a big stick on them. You know, you guys have all played video games like in an arcade before. Not, I'm not that old, right? You guys have been to an arcade. Um, so these things have like these giant, like these giant, like sticks that you can slam on and hopefully not break. And so uh, they're cool and all. Like they're, you know, you, there's like stores that like supply you with like these like industrial joysticks and things like that and buttons you can mash really hard without breaking them. Uh, but they didn't come with any drivers. And so my job was to write a driver for it. And so I had to pull up the documentation. And the documentation said, if you if you create a pointer pointing at memory address, whatever, let's say memory address 300, it wasn't. But let's just say, you know, if you, if you create a pointer at memory address 300, if you write the value 10 there, then if you wait one millisecond, the hardware will respond with a, a character, a, a unsigned, unsigned char, with zero being full left, 255 being full right on the joystick. And if you write the value 100 there, I'm just making numbers up. I don't remember this a long time ago. Uh, then it will give you the same thing, but for the vertical axis. And so you write a value, pause for a fraction of a second, and then you read from it. And so you end up reading and writing to the same variable. And if you have the optimizer on and you don't have it marked volatile, it'll just erase all of those reads and writes. You guys understand? Like, it'll just be like, we don't need to do any of that. You wrote to it. Why would you, when you read it, it's going to be the same value. But what happens is that spot in memory is actually controlled by the joystick. So you write a variable there. You write a value to the variable there. The joystick will think about it a little bit. And then it, it will overwrite that value with a new value. And then you have to read from it. And so that's what volatile is for. Volatile is like you can't assume that just because you put a 20 in there a second ago, there's still a 20 in there now. Somebody else might be writing to that spot in RAM. Does that make sense to you? It's not something you guys are going to encounter most of your life. Okay. Uh, oh, oh wow, Nickel Arcade. Is it dead? Is it is it gone now? I, I like the Nickel Arcade. Um... So volatile, uh, yeah, volatile const is the other qualifier, okay? So when we get this compiler error, and, so when we get this compiler error, we have const Batman, we are saying it's discarding qualifiers. So which qualifier are we discarding now? It can't be volatile, because we didn't put volatile in here, and in fact, you will probably never see volatile unless you're working in some very specific environment where it, you would use it all the time, actually. 
But like if you know, for like ninety nine percent of people, you're probably never gonna use volatile. Cons though we use all the time. Right? So uh why is this complaining? What what does it mean we're discarding qualifiers? Okay. What what does that mean? It says Passing const bat as this discards qualifiers. And the reason why I'm spending so much time on this is because this is an error message you will see over and over again. And uh, I'm explaining it to you. Uh, that's why we go to college to learn things, right? Uh, especially useful things, hopefully, right? We try to teach useful things. Volatile's not useful, but it's just kind of a fun, fun aside. Um, what, what does it mean we're discarding qualifiers here? It means we are calling a function that's not const. You guys remember the rule? Every time you make a member function, if it doesn't change the object, mark it as const. You can only call, the rule is you can only call const methods on const objects. So because Batman is const, we can't, we couldn't call walk before because walk was not marked const. Okay. And the error you will get is discards qualifiers. So just, so now you know what a qualifier is. There, you know, it's called CD, CD qualifiers in C, which is uh, const and volatile. Cool. You guys understand? All right, so uh, that's that's a little bit of C++ trivia. We're going to learn some other things. So uh, first of all, we're going to do multiple inheritance. And so what if, um, <laughs> here's a problem with multiple inheritance. What if fly had a function called walk? Which, uh, which one of these walks, when we call it here, is it going to call the walk on this guy or is it going to call the walk on this guy? Don't know. You got two walk functions. You, I don't know. You tell me. You know. Maybe we can try something like this, like walk, walk. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. What? You can do that. So the scope resolution operator can save us here. So we've got two different walk functions. One from the walk class. One from the fly class. So we can actually say, you know, uh, which one we're calling. It looks stupid. Uh, but it, it'll save us, but there's, there's an area where it can't save us. And that is when we do uh, a diamond pattern. Okay. So struct animal, so the animal class is going to have a uh, health as part of it and walk. This is a walking animal. So walk inherits from animal and fly inherits from animal. And now we've got a problem. Okay. So even if we put this back on fly here. We've got a problem, right? Because uh, if we see out man dot health, we've got two copies of health. Do you guys remember how how uh, inheritance works? When you inherit something like this, it copies and pastes everything in one class into the other class. So it is as if we had done this, right? Like it is as if we had made one health here and one health here. And now we're inheriting health twice. And we don't know uh, which one we're supposed to get, right? So, because uh, these don't have to be the same, right? Like this could be 10 and that could be 100. Which one Which one wins? I don't know, you know? Uh, and so if you try seeing health, it says member health found in multiple base classes. Yeah. Uh, and even if it's in the same one, then it will maybe give us a better diagnostic. Yeah. So it'll, it'll actually show us right here. Um, you've inherited it at once from bat to walk to animal, and you've inherited it at once from bat to fly to animal. And this is called the diamond pattern of inheritance because it looks like a baseball diamond, right? So, uh, let's go to the inheritance tab here. So we've got animal, we got bird, and sure, that's close enough. If we if both of us inherit off of this for bat, 
right? This is like the flies class. This is the walks class, whatever. Do you see what happens here? This is this is the diamond pattern. So everything that's inside of animal gets inherited twice in the bat. So it's copied and pasted. Everything inside of animal gets copied and pasted twice. Uh, and that's bad. <laughs> it's, it's now, now it doesn't know which one to use. Um, right? Do you guys do you guys understand the uh, the diamond pattern here and, and the problem with it? So good. I'm glad you guys understand it. Let's fix it. So we fix it by using what's called virtual inheritance. So you just put the virtual keyword there. What? what? Never seen virtual used in that way before, and it resolves the problems. So uh, learning point number one for today would be volatile, I guess. Learning point number two would be uh, virtual inheritance. Uh, we've used virtual before in a member function, right? If you want a member function to be overloaded, uh, then you have to mark it as virtual. Uh, not always, but in general, yeah. So if you have a if you have a function here in animal, you say virtual speak and see out. I am the platonic ideal of a of an animal. <laughs> right. And then the uh, and the void thank you virtual void speak. And then you know void speak override. See out I am a walking animal. And then fly, you could say I'll fly animal. And then bat is now uh, upset, right? So, final over, yeah, yeah, it's fair. Yeah, <laughs> so we have a problem with this where they've both been, they've both been overridden and so we don't know which one uh, to, to do here. Um, so let's see if we can, we can solve this. Yeah. <laughs> I am a bat is going to override both of them. So the problem is solved, right? Because because uh, we had two different overridden speak functions. We, we don't know which one we're supposed to use. And so we're just going to override both of them and say, I'm a bat. And then we're fine. Uh, I don't know if we need these anymore. I don't think we do. Yeah. Okay. So the keyword here is virtual. Okay, so virtual inheritance means uh, resolve um, resolve the diamond inheritance problem. It's maybe the the shortest way of explaining it. Anytime something gets inherited twice, if they're still the same when you merge them back together, like you have two different children, and those two different children have a child class that inherits off both of them, it tries merging them back together and avoiding that ambiguity problem. So uh, as you can see, though, like if they've both overridden the speak class, then then you got a problem, right? Like if you unless you overload it yourself like that, you know, it doesn't know it doesn't know which one to use, right? Uh, speak has more than one overrider. I, I I don't know which one to do. Okay. So virtual um, the virtual keyword. On a function means make inheritance work <laughs> on this function. How about that? Okay. So that when you call a function using a pointer or a reference, it, do it doesn't work if you do slicing. But if you call um, a function on an animal pointer, then when you have the virtual keyword, it'll look at itself in the mirror and be like, "Am I a monster? Am I a man? Who am I?" You know, and then it'll figure out which one of these subclasses it is and call the right function properly. Now, there is one more keyword here. So there's virtual. Uh, we went over this before, so these aren't learning points, but I'm just going to mention it. The override keyword makes sure we are overriding a virtual function. There's a new one here, which is the final keyword, uh, which means do not let anyone override me on this. So if I have a... Hmm. 
int get health function. Should be const, right? Turn health. If I have a get health function, a child class could override this and then cause problems because um, it's not marked virtual, right? And so if, if I had a if I had a pointer to an animal class, a child class could override it, and then it might call the animal classes get health sometimes. It might call the walk classes get health sometimes, and mm, we want to mark it as virtual so that all that works. But we really kind of don't want people to override this. Kind of, you know, it kind of makes sense, like, uh, for, for two reasons, right? For one, just from a philosophical perspective, we just might not want anybody to override getter set health because they should just do, like, we, we, we have the health function here. That's me. I'm responsible for it. <laughs> they just let a cat into my room. Meow. Like the door cracked open and a cat came in. It's amazing. All right. Um, yeah, so like from a philosophical perspective, I'm the person who's responsible for uh, get health and set health, right? Like nobody else should mess with it but me because it's my member variable. So I could have a void uh, virtual void set health, set stealth, set health. Health. Uh, health. And so I might not want these marked as virtual at all, just from a philosophical standpoint, but if they do overload it, then it could cause problems. So what do I do? You know, and so there is a keyword called final. And so final, final means nobody can override me. This is it. I'm the the truth, the way and the life. No one shall come to the father except through me. So if I try saying void set health and new health and do like health equals a hundred thousand, whatever. Um, if I try overriding this, it won't work. See this? Declaration of set health overrides a final function. Final means nobody can inherit off me from this point on. It does not have to be on the base class. For example, the base class might just be pure virtual equals zero, you know, please override me. And then when you over overload it, you know, in the base class, in the child class, you can mark it as final, which means if anybody inherits from that class, nobody can overload it. Does that make sense? So once you've marked a, a function as final, that's it. Nobody can, nobody below you in the class hierarchy can change that function. And that has two benefits. Um, two benefits. One is philosophical. Nobody should be able to change this. The other one is speed. Virtual has a cost to it. You know, I'm just making up a number here, but let's say it's a 15% speed cost for a small function. Just making up a number, just as a ballpark figure. Um, if you make, if you mark it as final, no cost. So this guy here doesn't need to do the, it doesn't need to do the class lookup because it is the only version of set health. It doesn't need to see, am I a walker? Am I a flyer? Am I a bat? Nope. It will always be called on the animal class version. And so um, a final uh, method can remove this cost. Okay. You guys understand? You with me? So the final keyword means nobody can overload me below me in the class hierarchy. Above it, fine. Below, no. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So virtual and final essentially cancel each other out. But it has the benefit of, um, like, like if, if you don't want children to override you, what if it's not marked virtual? Won't work. Final only works with virtual functions. So even though final and virtual sort of cancel each other out and remove the penalty for virtual, you can't mark something as virtual unless it's uh, 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 you can't mark something as final unless it's virtual, and that shuts off any of your kids being able to uh, change override you. Yep. So you have to mark it as virtual final for this to get shut down. All right. If you if you didn't have it as virtual, um, 
final, then they could override it, which you don't want. Uh, so you mark it as virtual final, so they can't override it, and you don't have a speed penalty. Okay. Um, final only works with virtual, yes. If I turn off virtual here, it will yell at me. You can't mark something as final unless it's virtual. Only virtual member functions can be marked as final. So that, that, that's how it is. You know, you just, if you don't want this function to be overloaded, you'd mark it as virtual final, yeah, not just final by itself. Uh, can you call final on the child? Yes. So let's go down it here and have the speak function here be marked as final. Uh, then it's going to get mad at us here because this is now overloading a final function, right? So it doesn't have to be the top level that's final. You can go down two hierarchies and mark it as final there. And once it's marked final there, if you try overloading it here down in bat, nope, sorry, you're trying to overload a final function. That's it. That's, that's the bottom level that it can be changed. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple other keywords and then we'll be done for the day. We're learning a lot of new keywords in C++ today. So virtual as a inheritance system, in addition to the virtual keyword on a member function. Uh, final uh, override, you already know. So let's talk about static. How many people here have ever been shocked by static electricity? Show of hands. Yeah, no relation. Okay, so static is one of the weirdest keywords. In C++, uh, maybe volatiles, volatiles kind of weirder because you're like, what? What do you mean the variable can change? I didn't change it, why are you changing it? Static's weird because it has three different meanings. <laughs> it has three very different meanings depending on where you use it. Okay, so we can break this into like static class member variables, uh, static global variables, um, static global variables and functions, I should say, um, and static variables inside functions. And so playground slides, yeah. Like my daughter would go down and her hair would just shh, like this. And she'd touch you and like shh, like the wrath of Thor like coming in on you. Um, okay, so let me let me uh, show you mm, mm, B first. Static int foo equals five. Global variable, right? Uh, maybe we'll just give this a better name, int score. Uh, score equals five. Okay. okay, and so we could say score equals ten, and see out score. And so this is just a global variable. You guys understand global variables? Yeah, uh, anybody, anybody can see global variables, right? Like you know, you know speak override. I'm a bat, and you can see out uh, score. All right. Anybody can see a global variable beneath it. Main can see it. The bat, the Batman speak function can see it. Compile and run it. You'll see. It prints out the score is five. Man dot speak. Why is it not going to compile? Anyone know? Why is it not allowing me to compile with dot speak called on Batman? I am the darkness. Function is not marked const. Anyone remember this from the beginning of lecture? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, it needs to be marked as a constant method, right? All right. It needs to be marked as a constant method. All right. Now, now everything's broken, right? 
because it's now not overriding anything, right? So we have to do this on all of them, all the way up. And all of those should have been marked as cons. Now it's good. Okay. Don't forget to mark your methods as const. I am a path. I am the darkness. And so it's going to print the value of score, which is five. And then down here, we're going to change the value of score to 10 and we print it. So what the heck is the difference between that and if we don't have static here, nothing. Okay. So what does it do? Um, it limits their scope to this file, technically a translation unit, but only things within this file can see this variable. Global variables are global, but static, uh, static variables and functions are only accessible within this file. Okay. So if I, if I make a function called foo and somebody in a different file calls foo, they won't be able to see it. It's file scoped name resolution. Does that make sense? So they're, they only exist within main.cc. My entire program is main.cc. That's why it makes no difference. If I had a hundred different files, then static becomes a lot more useful because it limits the scope to only things within that file. So you can't accidentally call things in a different file, even after you've linked them all together. Yep. So it's uh, it's useful in larger projects here. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Static variables inside functions. Okay. So what if uh, what if what if what if what if what if what if we have a function called speaker, and it takes a animal pointer named a, and it's going to call a points to speak. And if we, we got Batman, we got, uh, what else? Batwoman. We've got, of course, Catwoman. Now oh, we need a cat class going, okay. So the cat class struct cat, cats can't fly. So we just in here for the walk class. So. Uh, So, the, so what sound does a cat curl make? Yen, I think, right? Let's get in trouble with the school's firewall. There you go. Fortunately, nothing too bad. Right, cat curl. Yeah. Okay, so, so we got cats, we got bats. Can't have cat woman. We can have cat girl, though. Sure. All right. Uh, I'm always paranoid looking up anything with VPN on. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> Got to get a letter. Uh, why are you looking at cat? Okay. It's, it's the variable name. It's the, the name of the variable is cat. All right. Uh, <laughs> does including those files mean you can call a static variable? Um, it's a good question. I th hmm. The answer is yes. So if you uh, if you have because we're Files are kind of a weird concept in C++. So here we have bob.h, and then if you have um, main.cc include bob.h, then you have access to it. Because there's not really, like like I said earlier, like file is not really the right term to use. The, um, the actual term is called a translation unit, or to you. Um, and that's what you have after you've hashtag included everything, because remember, um, when you hashtag include something, it just copies and pastes all the files over. So, you know, it would, it would just bring the static variable into this file here. So, um, I use file as kind of like, kind of a not technically correct shorthand for translation unit because my students don't know what that means. So, um, yeah. All right. Now, if you had a non-static variable like this, then that variable would be accessible from other files. So you could say extern and score like that. And then that means there is a variable, um, say an extra neck and score. That means there's a variable in another file called score that you can read and write to. And so, um, 
that's oh my gosh, another keyword extern. Uh, this variable or function is elsewhere, not in this file, i.e. translation. So if you have a global in one file, you can access it using that. And after it all gets linked together, it will get fixed up. So static means other people, like it's just this file that can see it, this translation unit that can see it. Okay. So what is, uh, what is score going to be initialized to? What do you guys think? I didn't put equal zero on it. Do you guys uh, know what it's going to be initialized to? So you could write to it from a completely separate file in the same directory. Yeah. Files don't actually matter. All that matters is what you include, right? And so you could have five files that each include each other and merge them together into one mega file. Some people do this. It's called a, a Unity build in C++, and they do this to avoid having to recompile multiple files. Like if your files have a lot of overhead, like you're importing like a million lines of code into each file, uh, but the files themselves are really small, it might save you quite a lot of build time by just having them each include the other one and putting together a little 50 line program that's all put together and then including the million lines once instead of five times. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you'll see people do that where they include just other files to just merge them all together while still keeping the ability to have people working on different files independently and stuff like that. Uh, for Unity, no, like it just means all the, like you have one .cc file, essentially. And in that case, static would be pointless because everything's in one translation unit, right? For, for this purpose. So score is in fact initialized to zero. Did you guys know that? If you have a global variable, all globals, all globals are zero initialized for like instant chars and things. So regular stack uh, variables are not initialized to zero, but globals are. Okay. Um, okay. So static. Right. So static. Okay. So we're going to call uh, man. We're going to call speaker on man. Const. So it doesn't like that. Oh, yeah, it's got to be an ampersand. There we go. So we're going to call speaker passing a pointer to man, passing a pointer to woman, passing a pointer to girl. And if we do this, all the inheritance will work correctly. I'm the darkness, I'm the darkness, and yan. Okay, right, because that's a bat, that's a bat, that's a cat girl. All right, so uh, we can probably get rid of the score at this point. You can see score, though, was zero when we printed it out. Um, Yeah, score was zero. It's initialized to zero. Globals are initialized to zero. Okay. Got two bats, got to go. Okay. So what if what if we wanted to track how many times this function got called? You could do it with a global variable, right? You could have a, a variable like this, like integer uh, times called equals zero. And then you could say like, you know, uh, C error. We're doing a little, you know, we can write to the error, standard error, and like instrument our code. So instrumenting your code means like figuring out what's being called and how often and things like that. It's very useful for like your benchmarking project, you know, like which functions are getting called more often than others, you know. It's push back getting called more often or push front, you know. And so we can see out uh, plus plus, let's see here. Speaker called plus plus times plus 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 times called times. So now you'll see uh, it's now tracking how many times we called the function. You guys see, you guys see the value of that? Now, if we had another function called, uh, I don't know, um, walker, which could only take a walk pointer.
Now, we would need to make another variable for this called like times called q. I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, I see where I'm getting with, with this. Like times called is fine if there's only one, but now it's going to get stupid. Walker called, times called, two times. You guys see what I'm getting at here? So, um, So it'll track it. Walker's been called three times. Speaker's been called three times. Um, bats have two legs. Cats have four legs. Everything's working properly. It's just kind of annoying to have to make a new global variable with a different name. And if in another file, there's another another variable called times called, they're going to conflict. Let me show you something cool. So instead of doing that, I can put it inside of the function and mark it as static. Now you might look at that and be like, isn't that going to reinitialize times called to zero every time you call the function? And it would if it didn't have the static keyword on it, right? This is completely pointless, right? Speaker called one time, speaker called one time, speaker called one time, speaker called one time. But if you mark it as static, what this means is it's a global variable that's only accessible here. So the static here, means uh, static variables inside functions means it is a global only visible here, which is nice. Okay, only in the scope can it see it. And so here, look at this. They don't have to have different names. They're not polluting the global namespace. Down here in main, if I tried printing out, you know, times called or something, I've never met this man in my life. What are you talking about, right? I've never seen this person, right? And so it's really nice. If that if that variable is only needed inside of speaker or inside of Walker, why make it a global? Nobody else needs to know about it. Globals in general are considered a code smell. A code smell is something that you should not do, uh, or by default, right? Maybe you could do it. Uh, triggers uh, <laughs> trigger someone doing a code review on you. It's so like, when they see you doing this, they're like, are you sure you need to do that? Are, are you positive? Like, by default, you're like, ah, there's probably a better way of doing this, you know? Uh, things like mutable, things like singletons, um, things like global variables. There's a lot of code smells where if somebody's doing a code review, they're like, ah, you, hmm, do you really need a global variable? Like, do you? And and the person's like, yeah, well, how am I how am I gonna tell how many times this function got called otherwise? And you're like, well, have you heard of a static variable? With a static variable, that's not corrupting the global namespace. You're not running out of names. Like times called can only be used once. In all of Microsoft Windows, that variable can only exist once. And all of the global namespace of Microsoft Windows, you're not corrupting that anymore. Um. It's all just packaged nicely into your function. Yeah. So that is a static, that is a static, uh, uh, static variable inside of a function is a global variable that only exists inside of the function. And the static uh, class member variable is kind of similar to that. So if we want to have a, uh, if we want to also instrument like the animal class, we want, we want to track how many times as any animal, including bats and cats and dogs or whatever, anytime an animal is, is, is spawned, we want to do something. We want to track it. We want to uh, maybe just count how many times they've been made so that we can instrument it later. So we can have uh, an integer here called, you know, animals spawned. But then, you know, Batman, Batman will have his own animals spawned, right? And... Catwoman will have her own animal spawn. And that's not really what we want. Do you guys understand me? Like, we don't actually want Batman to have his own count of how many animals are spawned and Batwoman to find 
how many animals respond. No, we want this in one place. We want this only once, okay? And uh, what we're gonna do is mark it as static. And so a static, a static class member variable is associated with the class, not the object. In other words, all animals will share the same animals spawn member variable. It doesn't take up all the extra memory either. It's only held in one place. It's like a global variable that all of the animals can access. So we can say in our constructor, animal uh, animals spawned plus plus. And then there's a weird way of initializing these things. And the weird way of initializing these things looks like this. Animal, animals spawn equals zero. Uh, mm, oh, it has to be an int. It's weird. It's weird to that. I don't, I don't know why you can't do it this way. Like everybody wants to do it this way. I don't know why you can't like that, but it doesn't allow you. Can't do it. Only cons static static constants can be done that way. That's fine, but um, yeah, you, it's it's a weird it's a weird weird syntax. I know. So now check this out. We go to the bottom over here, and we spawn Batman, Batwoman, Catgirl, um, Cat, uh, Catman, Do, Catman, Do. If we see out, if we want to see out, hey, how many animals have we made over the span of our wonderful adventure here? You know, how many how many times did the animal class get created? You know, you're curious. You, you know, you're, this is what instrumentation is for. Like, how many times did we call this function? How many times did we call this function? How many animals did we make? Right now, we can do this. See out. We could do man dot animal spawn. And we could see out woman dot animal spawned. We could do that. We could. They're the same variable. Yeah. So there were four animals spawned. Man, woman, girl, mando. And if we ever like overrode that, we could. We could say man dot animals spawned equals forty thousand. And if we change it in man's animal spawned, it's going to change it in woman's animal spawned as well, because it's the same variable. You guys see that? It's the same variable. They all share the same variable. It's only held once. You don't have multiple copies of it. But here's the really cool thing. Here's the really cool thing. You don't actually have to call it on a, it's, it's not actually a member variable of an object. It's a member variable of the class. So you can actually say animal, colon, colon, animal spawned. You guys see that? You can actually say, hey, animal class, Give me your member variable. That's what a static class member is. How many animals have been spawned ever? And you can actually ask the animal class that. Normally classes don't have anything. There's nothing concrete about them. They're just like a blueprint. And then you instantiate them. You make an instance of them by making a variable of that type. But with a static, with a static um, member variable, you can actually say, hey, animal class, how many animals have been spawned ever? And it'll tell you. Four. And what's really cool about that is you don't need an object at all. Even, even before any animals have been created at all, which normally you wouldn't be able to access a dot, you know, you can't say man dot animal spawn when man doesn't exist. You can actually do that before any, any uh, guys have been spawned ever. And you can see right here, nope, nobody's been made yet. And then at the end of the program, four people got made. So that's uh, that's the thing. That's a thing. That's a cool thing. What do you, uh, so this is uh, uh, static member variables are associated with the class, not with individual objects. Uh, they're pretty commonly used for instrumentation. They're also pretty, pretty commonly used for things like uh, static const and max. Some of that. So like every animal has a max health of 100. Can't change. There's no reason to store this as a variable anywhere. Um, 
like each animal doesn't need to save a copy of this integer because everybody has a max health of 100 and you can um, see out all animals have a max health of animal colon colon max health. So that even before I make a single animal, I can um, I can ask what's the maximum health of all animals in this game. And you can do this for other things, like if you have an insect class, the insect class could always have six legs. Uh, you know, the octopus class can always have eight legs, and those can always just be held as static constants that are associated with octopus as a concept. Octopus, octopi as a, a platonic ideal, every octopus has eight, eight legs, and every insect has six legs, and every spider has eight legs, and, you know. Do you guys know what crawls on four legs in the morning, walks on two legs in the afternoon, and uh, on three legs in the evening? Hmm? Hmm? You? <laughs> After a long night out, <laughs> four legs in the morning. A drunk person. <laughs> uh, I forget this one. Uh, this, this was, I think... Uh, the riddle of the Sphinx that uh, asked uh, Alexander the Great, you know, this all, I think. <laughs> yeah, after six Dutch rebels, it's just... Mm. Um, so, it wasn't like a human over its life cycle, exactly, yeah. So babies crawl on four legs, then when you walk, you're on two legs. When you're old, you have the cane. You have a cane, so you have three legs. The riddle of the Sphinx is different. I don't know, man. It's not real anyway, so... <laughs> All mythology. All right, let's 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 give you guys one more. Let's give you one more code smell, and this one's called mutable. Okay, so we've got here a constant Batman. Batman can't change, but what if what if we wanted to change something on Batman, despite it being a constant? Like we have string name equals uh, uh, Bruce. Bryce, Bruce, Wayne. What if, what if we want to do something really terrible and say, well, okay, most of the time Batman's Bruce Wayne, but woman.name equals uh, Miranda. Okay, there's a lot of different names. Uh, Kate Kane. Okay. Roxy. I don't know, dude. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's just do Catherine Webb. Whatever. Okay. Just pick one of them. All right. Catherine Webb. Now, uh, Barbara. <laughs> so why can I not change uh, Batwoman's name to Catherine Webb? Pretty, there's a this is not a trick question. Um, should be pretty obvious. Why can I not change that woman's name to Catherine Webb? No viable overloaded equal sign doesn't really help us. So, why, why can I not do this? Uh, the object's constant. Yeah, you can't change anything on it, right? But what if I told you you could with one simple trick that computer scientists hate? Mutable. Ba -ba -ba -bum. It's now changeable. What? Yeah, if you mark a member variable as mutable, now you can change a member variable on a constant object. It's not constant anymore. It's kind of constant, but it's not really. But it kind of is. Yeah. Good coding stuff. It's brilliant. Hello, Ada. This is how I like to code. I like to make constants and then everything mutable and then people just like, what? And then they can't fire you. It's amazing. It's, that's, that's the trick to life. You just, you know, you throw curveballs at people all day. They, they, they swing, they miss. They're just like, what? They can't fire you because nobody understands your code. It is amazing. I, let me tell you. 
So yeah, you guys see this? I've got here um, a constant object, I'll type bat, uh, but bat's name is mutable, so I can change it. Now there's an obvious question here, like why the hell would you do this? Please ask on Discord the obvious question. <laughs> like if you want to change it, why, why make it a constant, right? Uh, why would you do this? Thank you. Uh, the answer is, yeah, <laughs> perfect. Hazleton, have you seen uh, Mutable before? How could you do this? I could do it very easily, you know. <laughs> you just uh, you just do it, you know, and and hope that your company doesn't doesn't fire you for writing bad code. <laughs> but it's like I said, it uh, it's it's a code smell, right? If I if I was doing a code review, a code review is like, you know, somebody's written code in your company and they want to add it to the code base, and you want to look at it first. Uh, if I'm if I'm doing a code review and I see mutable in there, I'm gonna instantly like. Let's pause here for a second. Have you defend this to me? Why does why why what is going on here? You know why does this need to be mutable? Well, I wanted to change it on a constant. Is it a constant then? You know, <laughs> like is it actually constant? Uh, so, um, so I can give you one example where I've actually used it non-ironically like this, and uh, that is when working with a uh, set so the um the set class set of integers named s so you do like s dot insert pin and see out s dot contains pin. uh And so you can see, yeah, look, it contains 10. So uh, sets, basically, you insert things into them, and then you can say, hey, is that thing in there? Yes, no, great. That's basically what they're for. So like, you know, you're 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 adding names to a, to a wedding list, and so you just keep tossing them on the set, and then every time you get a new name, you just check, like, hey, have I seen this guy before? Oh, there, I have? Great, print out an, print out an error message, duplicate entry. You know, we're trying to invite, you know, our evil auntie twice, right? That's what sets are for. Now. The re what does this have to do with mutable? When things have been inserted into a set, they can't change. They are immutable. Everything that you put into a set is constant. Okay? They become constant even if you don't want them to be constant. So if you're doing something like um, you've got a, a set containing or an unordered set uh, uh, containing all of the uh, chess players in the world. Um... And it's it's uh, it's uh, using their um, their social security number or ID to like hold them in the set. And you want to like update their ELO. You know, they, do you guys know what ELO is? Like, uh, you um, have a rating, a chess rating, things like that. Um, and you want to update their ELO because everything in the set is immutable. What you have to do is you have to copy them out of the set, delete them. Add three to their ELO, and then insert them back in, and that's kind of annoying. So uh, when I when I wrote my ELO assignment, I actually made the ELO rating mutable, so that you could just go to that spot in the data structure and be like plus three ELO, minus three ELO, done. So that's that's one place where I've used it non-ironically, and the reason why that works, the reason the only reason why that works is because the set class doesn't use the ELO to sort the, the data structure. If it did, you would completely break everything. Like if you if you edited somebody's social security number once they're in the system that's sorted by social security number, everything explodes. So it's it's again one of these things where you're like, yeah, do you really need to do this? You know, maybe you should just copy it out and change it into the back end. You know, but in that case I was more offended by all the needless copying in and out and all the extra lines of code. I wanted to just be like, yo, uh, you know, uh, Carlson, you know, just won another match, plus 10 ELO to him, you know, just plus 10 to his ELO, done, you know. And so that's that's a case where I've used mutable non-ironically, because it's not sorted on his ELO, so it doesn't break anything, it's actually fine. Okay, you guys understand? So mutable is our last keyword for today. We've gone through a lot of brand new C++ keywords today. Mutable, uh, you can change this. Remember, 
variable on a const object. Um, code smell most of the time. So we've gone over volatile, virtual inheritance, final, static, three different meanings for static, extra and briefly, and mutable. And so this is a lot of miscellaneous C++ knowledge that is uh, some, some more important than others. Uh, volatile, you probably go your whole life without knowing volatile. Uh, mutable, yeah, you probably don't need to know that either, but like virtual inheritance is kind of important. Uh, Static is kind of important also. So, um, extra and you'll see, like you'll see extra in a lot. You'll see, uh, you'll see volatile in maybe like CSI 45. Um, um, mutable, you probably shouldn't. Static comes up quite a bit. Final, final comes up all the time. You know, when you're doing, when you're doing inheritance, like you'll just see final. Yep, it's, it's a thing. So that's our class for today. Uh, hope you guys are uh, getting close to being finished on your linked list uh, labs. That's due on Friday, which means all of your coding needs to be done around tomorrow. So you have time to benchmark and you have time to um, fill the server. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so you have time to benchmark and you have time to write your report. Okay. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for coming out. I will see you on the flip side.